So, you know, I'm gonna, I have to preface this really quick by saying that the Fall Down Go Boom Biomechanics of Trauma is not new. We've been touring this for over six years now, and it's actually one of the more popular trauma topics that, uh, that I tour, but um, so we decided this year, or I shouldn't say this year, 2019, we were gonna expand this to four one-hour topics um, and put in way more videos. And so this summer, my staff and I have been working really hard on updating this in preparation for 2019. So you guys are getting the first look at it because we've actually got the first two hours done. So obviously I only have 40 minutes and I now have a four hour presentation. So I, what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna go till we get to 40 minutes, wherever that is, and we're just gonna end there because it's changed. And for those of you that might be following along on the, uh, on the slides that I submitted, we submitted them before the changes. So you're not gonna find that they correlate as well as they should. Um, uh, because you guys are getting brand new. In fact, last night I looked at the slides myself for the first time. Some of them I had never seen. My staff have been working on them all week. So um, th that, that, that first thing out of the way. The second thing that I want to uh, uh, mention is, you know, biomechanics I always find is an interesting topic for um, especially our inpatient uh, staff. Now, for those of you that work pre-hospital, biomechanics is part of what you do. But a lot of times this information gets lost when our patients arrive on the inpatient setting. And I think that's very unfortunate. I can look back on my time as a trauma program manager. I really did my best to try to maintain biomechanics throughout the patient's stay. Now, unfortunately, I was a trauma program manager back in the days before cell phones really, you know, were, were in use the way they are today. So uh, we actually had to give Polaroid cameras to all of our pre-hospital folks and they would do Polaroids and bring them in. And then every trauma room, we had a big whiteboard with the electrical tape outline of a car. And when they would arrive, the pre-hospital folks would put a drawing of where the patient was in the vehicle and where the intrusion was on the vehicle. They'd put the pictures up there and all the pre-hospital um, findings were also written up on the whiteboard. And then we would transfer that whiteboard information into the patient's chart as well as all the pictures that arrived so that everybody along the continuum of care through the OR, critical care, med surge, and even rehab could always look back and understand the biomechanics of the trauma of how that patient came out of it. And I think a lot of times we don't do a good job of transferring that data. So hopefully I'm gonna whet your appetite just a little bit today for biomechanics. So I do wanna, I want, do wanna give a warning up front. Uh, now this is the first time we've done this warning, but um, watching some of the videos, there are some very graphic videos. I don't know if we're gonna get to them. Some of the more graphic ones come under falls and, and motorcycle crashes and stuff, which I doubt we'll get to. But, I do want to just warn you up front that there are people that will be injured and in some cases uh, may die in these videos. We have obscured the faces of anybody who doesn't live uh, out of respect for them. But if you feel that uh, watching a video that's graphic may um, distort your uh, delicate nature, then probably you shouldn't be in the trauma field, first of all. <laughs> But you may want to step out of the room because there could be some disturbing videos in this. There also is some language in some of the videos um, and we will warn you before that. Be and again, if you uh, haven't heard this language before, you probably don't work in the trauma world. But anyway, uh, you have been warned, so you don't have to put it on your eval. I'm just telling you it's there. All right, so just really quickly, I don't want to spend a lot of time on, on physics, but you know, it will help a little bit when we get to the videos if we just go over physics really quick. So remember Newton's two laws, which really have a, a strong impact on uh, trauma. For Newton's first law, body at rest will remain at rest until occupied by a, uh, external force. In other words, a body stays at rest. Newton's second law, a that the force an object can exert is a product of its mass times its acceleration. In other words, a body in motion remains in motion. All right, and, and we'll talk a little bit more about those when we get into this, but um, just, just so you kind of remember those two laws. So if you watch that video there, I mean, you could see that first, if I go back, let me see if I can do it again. So I'll, I'll, I'll talk through the video for a minute, but you know, you obviously had a vehicle sitting stationary. You had another vehicle moving. When the second vehicle, the, the back vehicle hits the first vehicle, obviously the, the, uh, the vehicle is no longer at rest, right? The vehicle now picks up that acceleration uh, of the first vehicle. So the first vehicle stops, but the second vehicle then picks up the energy and moves forward. So if we watch it again, there you can see Newton's laws at play. Um, so uh, the body at rest will remain at rest until acted upon by an uh, external force. The external force is the other vehicle. So the other vehicle exerts its energy on the first vehicle, and then the first vehicle picks up that energy while the second vehicle loses the energy and stops. Now, if we look at the actual, um, the, the five collisions of Newton's law, you've probably heard of these before, but I think it's important to review them before we get into the videos. Uh, Newton's first law, or Newton's law, I should say, says that there's, there's potentially five collisions in every motor vehicle collision. So the first collision is going to be the vehicle 
acting on whatever force is going to change its, its uh, inertia, right? So if you don't recognize our very advanced drawing on PowerPoint, that is looking at a car from the top down, okay? You can see the trunk, you can see the hood, you can see um, the, the middle part, the, the body of the car. And if you're wondering what the yellow blob is, that's a human being behind a steering wheel. You can see the steering wheel there. And if you wonder what the red thing is, that's a heart, okay? So that's what you're looking at if you didn't recognize our very advanced drawing of PowerPoint. Now we're gonna put this into motion, and we're gonna put this car into motion and it's gonna hit a tree. All right, and you can see our, our very advanced tree up there as well. Now, of course, when the, so, so if we put it in motion, the car moves forward and it hits the tree. That's collision number one. So the first collision is the vehicle striking whatever it strikes. Now again, according to Newton's law, it's gonna remain in motion until a, an external force acts on it. So at this point, the tree acts on the car and the car comes to a stop, right? So that's your first collision. Now, sadly, for those of us in the inpatient side, this is the collision that gets lost. Unless your EMS are doing pictures, unless your EMS are transferring intrusion and crush um, information to you, we rarely get this. The best we get in the hospital is, you know, the, 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 the damage was very, the vehicle was very damaged or whatever, and you, get, you don't get this. There's a lot of information, as you're gonna see in a few minutes when I get into the actual videos, that can be taken off of this picture. Um, and, and, and it really tells us a lot about the potential injuries the patient has. So the first collision is the car meeting whatever its opposing force is. Now, as you might remember, the second collision involves the human itself. So whatever's in motion will remain in motion. So while the car has stopped, the patient will remain in motion until the patient reaches an opposing force. Now, in this example, there's no seat belt or airbag, so the opposing force will be the steering wheel. So if you watch, you can see the human continue to move forward and strike the steering wheel. Now this is the trauma you and I see when we're on the inpatient side, right? When the patient arrives, we see the second collision trauma. Unless you have pictures, you lose first collision trauma. But second collision trauma is what appears on the surface of the patient. So it's as the, as the patient's external surface meets whatever's inside of the vehicle, you get to see that. Now, Typically, second collision injuries are not life-threatening. They're generally just surface injuries, but they do give us a great indication of what's happening underneath. So you want to pay very close attention to your second collision injuries, which would be things like seat belt marks and bruising and deformities and those types of things. Now, if I put this into motion, the third collision would state that whatever's in motion remains in motion. That means internal organs are gonna keep moving even after the body stops. So if you watch the heart in this picture, the heart continues to slide forward until it meets an opposing force. Of course, that opposing force would be the uh, sternum. And now the heart slams into the sternum. Now remember, we'll, we'll talk about this more in just a second, but that um, energy can never be, uh, it never disappears. So that means that every one of these collisions involves the same speed as the first collision. So if the vehicle was moving at 50 miles per hour, when it strikes the tree, that's the energy dissipated, but the patient will hit the steering wheel at 50 miles per hour, and the heart will hit the sternum at 50 miles per hour because that energy never dissipates. So you get that third collision. Now your third collision injuries are the injuries that are, are, are gonna be the more serious ones. Um, these, are, these are the ones we don't see until you do a CT scan or um, surgical procedure. We don't see your third collision injuries, they're internal, but these are your life-threatening injuries. Now your second collision injuries can help you point to what your third collision injuries are, but you don't actually see the third collision injuries for the most part externally. Now there is potentially a fourth and a fifth injuries um, your fourth and uh, fifth injury, uh, your fourth collision, I should say, there's a fourth and fifth collision. Your fourth collision is gonna be your secondary impacts. So if we watch this video, you're gonna see a side impact collision um, and you're gonna see an initial impact with transfer of energy, but then watch the vehicle. I think if I remember right, it's the, uh, it's the vehicle that, um, that whose front end is, in, uh, is wrecked, if I remember right, will have a secondary collision with a curb and you're gonna see two impacts on this patient. So. And there you could see the, the car hitting the curb. And that, so that, that patient would have experienced two different collisions, the original collision and then uh, the, the energy of the collision of them hitting the curb. And then the, the fifth collision is any flying objects or other persons in the vehicle. Um, if there is things within the vehicle, and, and again, if we get that far, we got some great pictures of people inside vehicles during motor vehicle collisions, and you'll watch them as bullets within the, within the vehicle and how they strike other people and so on. Uh, now, Newton's laws basically state that uh, there's three types of injuries that come out of a, a motor vehicle collision. 
and they are tensile injuries, shearing injuries, and compressive injuries. And when you stop to think about every trauma patient you've taken care of, their injuries are gonna be one of those three. Those are the three injuries that uh, occur in a motor vehicle collision. So you have a deceleration force where energy is transferred to the body. There's deformation of the tissue. If the deformation of the tissue exceeds the elasticity or viscosity of the tissue, then injury results. Now let's look at these three injuries really quickly. Let's start with tensile injury. Um, tensile injury is stretching injury. What you have to remember is that you're going to have, um, you know, some, of, some parts of the body are fixed and some parts of the body are not fixed. And so when you have body parts moving forward at whatever, 30, 40, 50, 60 miles per hour, the ones that are fixed are going to slow down faster than the ones that aren't. I think the best example of this would be the aorta. The ligamentum arteriosum holds the aorta to the back of the uh, um, wall of the chest so that the, the aortic arch itself is held back. It's going to stop quicker. The heart's not held into place. The heart just kind of sits um, on top of the diaphragm, but it's not really fixed. So when the, when the, when the heart slides forward, it's going to hit the front of the chest, but the aorta is going to stay fixed to the back, and you're going to get a tensile uh, pulling of the tissue between the aortic root and the heart. And that's, of course, where aortic injuries come from. So that's just one example of a tensile type of injury. Now, shearing injuries occur when you have two body parts next to each other with different densities. And that means they're going to slide at different speeds depending on their density. The best example of this would be the gray and the white matter in the brain. The gray and the white matter are different densities. So when they slide during a motor vehicle collision, the white matter is going to slide faster than the gray matter, and it's going to slide across the other one and shear the tissue in between and you end up with a shearing type of injury. So that's your second one. Now compressive injuries, as the name implies, is where you have um, uh, parts of the body compressed by other parts of the body. The best example of this one would be a spleen or a liver contained in the front of the abdominal wall. So when the patient slides forward, everything behind it, bowel, pancreas, kidneys, whatever, are going to slide forward and they're going to squish the liver and the spleen to the front of the chest wall, causing a compressive injury of those organs. And that's it. When you stop to think about trauma, those are the three types of injuries that we will see patients have, tensile, shearing, or compressive, and how they work. Now, the last thing I want to do before we get into actual biomechanics of motor vehicle collisions is just to remember about energy. Energy cannot be created, nor can it be destroyed, but it can change forms, and you'll see that in the videos to follow. So, you know, when we talk about a motor vehicle collision, when a, when a motor vehicle is moving at 50 miles per hour, um, you know, how is, how, if, if you break, the energy is, trans, is transferred into a, um, a chemical, or not a chemical injury, into a, uh, into a thermal injury, ener energy as the brake pads touch one another. So if the, if the patient is braking before the motor vehicle collision, some of the energy will be dissipated by the, the brake pads and the thermal energy that's created there. Some of the energy will be absorbed by the actual tire and there's friction against the pavement. A lot of the energy will be transferred in the collision and that energy transfer is gonna either be transferred to the other vehicle or to the patient's body. So, we're going to watch this as another rear end collision, and again, it's just all about energy transfer here. You're going to see how you have one vehicle sitting still, a second vehicle hits it from behind, and you're going to see the first vehicle stop, but remember, energy cannot be dissipated, right? It always has to exist. So where is the energy transferred to? The front vehicle. And the front vehicle takes off at the same speed that the first vehicle stopped. It just transferred the energy from one to the other. One stops, and then the other one picks up with the same speed, okay? Um, the, the other thing I want to mention as we get into these videos is just to remember some of the car safety features that you're going to see, and most of these have to do with energy transfer. The front and the rear crumple zone, which we'll, we'll see a lot of and talk a lot more when we get into this. Cars today are designed to have crumple zones in the front and the back. You can see them in purple up there on the screen. And those crumple zones are exactly what they, uh, what they say they are. They, they crumple or they bend very easily in a collision. Why? So the energy is dissipated by the metal and it doesn't get transferred into the passenger compartment. And that's why you can tap somebody at five miles per hour and end up with a pretty crumpled bumper because it's meant to crumple, because it's meant to accept that energy and take it away from the patient. Airbags and, and, um, and seat belts are all about energy transfer. When you have an airbag and you go into it, 
that's going to slow, that's going to slow down your deceleration and accept some of the energy from the patient. Same with seat belts. What they do is they, they accept the energy so it doesn't get transferred off to the patient. So when we look at all these car safety features, they all have to do with the transfer of energy. The other thing I would just want to make sure I mention, because we're going to talk a lot about this when we get into motor vehicle collisions, is the difference between crush and intrusion, which has a lot to do with energy transfer. Crush refers to the amount of deformation of a vehicle outside the passenger compartment, so mainly in the crumple zones. And crush is important. Believe it or not, the more crush there is, the better it is for the patient, because that means that much more energy was dissipated outside the passenger compartment. Whereas intrusion refers to how far into the passenger compartment the damage is. And as we're gonna see when we get into these videos, um, that you can actually estimate patient injury by degree of intrusion. And when your pre-hospital goes so far as to say, you know, you got, you're, you're taking care of a near side lateral impact with moderate damage and about five inches of intrusion, that says a lot. Understanding um, the, the biomechanics of intrusion, which is how far into the passenger compartment uh, the damage goes, in, and we usually measure it in inches here in the United States, um, tells you a lot about potential patient injury. So intrusion is the amount of um, um, intrusion into the passenger compartment, and it directly correlates with patient in injury, whereas crush is the amount of damage outside the passenger compartment, and it's the opposite. It tends to indicate lack of patient injury. The last thing I want to just mention before we go into the motor vehicle collisions is just to remember the body parts that are injured. Any organ filled with gas is compressible and less likely to be injured. Uh, so solid organs like the liver and the spleen are not gas filled. Therefore, they um, don't do as well with energy and they're more likely to be injured. Whereas your gas filled organs will tend to stretch, compress and change shape and therefore they accept energy much better. And then the larger the area of force dissipation, the more pressure is reduced to a specific spot. This is what airbags are about as well. Instead of just striking a steering wheel, which is a small portion, an airbag covers a very large body of the area and allows the energy to be dissipated over a much larger area than a steering wheel over a smaller area. Now this is especially important, we, I know we won't get this far today, but when we, when we get into falls, a lot of the injury that has to do with falls has to do with how, how the patient landed and how energy is dissipated. But to a lesser degree, we'll see this in motor vehicle collisions as well. So let's start with some motor vehicle collision videos. All right, so let's, and what I wanna do with, uh, with motor vehicle collisions is uh, we're gonna talk about the, 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 the there's actually uh, f five main uh, motor vehicle collisions. We're gonna talk about four of them today. Frontal collision, lateral impact, rollover, and rear end. The one that I'm not gonna talk directly about, but we'll talk indirectly about it is rotational motor vehicle collisions, but we'll, we'll do that indirectly. So does anyone want to stab a guess? Of those, of those five listed up on the screen, which one, based on trauma registry data, carries the highest risk of inner, injury? So here, nearsighted lateral impact, does everyone agree? Which one? Oh, f far side lateral impact, okay, so we got a near side, we got a far side? Rollover? All right, well let me give you the data, here it is. Whoever said near side lateral impact, pat yourself on the back. That is the number one for injury. Number two is far side. Frontal is number three. Now let me just address rollover for the whoever said it. Rollover carries the highest fatality rate as opposed to the highest injury rate. So you see more fatalities out of rollovers than you do injuries. All right, so let's start with frontal crashes. Now there's really three main types of frontal crashes that you will care for patients. Um, and a frontal crash is defined as a crash anywhere between 11 and one o'clock if you were to put the car on a, or the vehicle on a clock. So you can see there in, in, uh, in you know, the, how, how we define crashes. So any crash between 11 and one o'clock is considered a frontal crash. 30 to 40% of crashes overall are frontal. Now here's the three types of frontal crashes and they carry different injury patterns. So I wanna look at them separately. There's a full frontal. <laughs> which is where you, not what you're thinking, and that's not gonna happen. I know I gave you a graphic warning, but there's no full frontal up here today. But a full frontal is exactly what the name implies, where, where you have two vehicles coming straight onto one another, all right? So you have the, the energy being straight on. You can also have an offset frontal, where you don't hit you know, exactly at 12 o'clock, but you may hit like at 12.30, 
or 11.30 or you know 11 or one. So you kind of have it offset from the clock a little bit. Those are offset frontals. And then you can have a narrow object frontal, which is, as the name implies, where the vehicle hits a narrow object like a tree or a light post, okay? Now the injury patterns are different depending on what type of frontal the patient was involved in. So let's look at the three separately. Let's start with a full frontal. Now, I'll show you the, the video of the full frontal in a minute, but the nice thing, if there's any nice thing about full frontal, is this is where our safety systems were developed. If you think about all the safety systems in a car, front crumple zone, occupant cage, seat belts, airbags, knee bolsters, everything we've designed to be safe in a car were designed for a full frontal. Making these of the frontals the safest, not to say the frontals are the safest thing, but if you're going to be in a frontal, a full frontal is going to provide you with the, the greatest amount of... Um, uh, protection because this, as, as you'll see in a video in a few uh, slides, it, uh, your, your uh, safety systems don't work on offset frontals. They only work on full frontals. But anyway, here's a video of a full frontal for you. All right. So an offset frontal, as I already said, the name implies is where the, the, uh, the car is going to be hit just off of 12 o'clock. So somewhere between 11 and 1, but not at 12. And um, let me show the video first. But you, you, you will see there's an ejection in this video, um, and that's not uncommon because with offset frontals, not only do you have uh, the frontal impact, but usually it's also going to put the vehicle into a rotation. It's going to rotate the vehicle because of energy dissipation, which creates a whole new set of in injuries, and you'll see that in this video. All right, so that was your offset frontal, as you can see. <laughs> it, it, was, uh, it was at 11 o'clock. As, as you know, it, it was about 11 o'clock as opposed to a full 12 o'clock. Um, now, your offset frontals are more dangerous and likely to be fatal than a full frontal because it bypasses most of the safety mechanisms. For example, you have those frames in the front of the vehicle, as you can see there. If you get hit at 11 o'clock, you're going to miss the frames, which means that the other vehicle is going to go by the safety frames, and it's going to drive directly into the passenger compartment, and you're going to get direct intrusion into the passenger compartment. There's also less crumple zone. The farther away you get from the, the front of the vehicle to the side, the less crumple zone you have, and therefore the patient's going to take on more energy. And the patient may not be propelled directly into the airbag, and we'll see that in a video in a minute. They end up being propelled off the airbag, so they, they miss the airbag altogether. And then, as I already said, it causes rotation. Rotation is more likely to cause ejection from the vehicle, but it also causes a whole different set of energy transmission to the patient that's more serious for the patient. So here's a video of an offset frontal. And uh, it's, it's, this, one's a, this, is, this one involves a dummy, but you can definitely see from the inside of the car how the safety mechanisms completely fail. Watch how the um, crumple zone, uh, I, I'm sorry, the, uh, the safety bars are missed. And so you can see the energy being directed right through the hood into the passenger compartment because it misses those uh, safety bars at the front. The crumple zones completely fail. Um, and you'll also see how the airbag and the seatbelt fail this patient as well. Uh, you miss the safety bar at the front. Now watch the patient slide off the airbag. Completely misses the airbag, right? <clears throat> All right. The last thing I'll talk about is the narrow object frontal. The narrow object frontal is also more serious than the full frontal because you have a much smaller point of impact, which means more energy is going to be transmitted directly into the passenger compartment when you have a narrow frontal as opposed to a full frontal. So you have increased injury potential because there's more energy focused on a smaller area, and it, will, it may also bypa bypass those frame rails that we talked about, depending on where they hit. If they hit directly in the center or on either side of the frame rail, then the object will go through the frame rail, meaning the energy is going to be dissipated directly into the patient compartment. So here you can see a, full, uh, a narrow object frontal. All right. We also, as we, as, we, as we look at these injury potentials coming up in a minute, we also have to think about how the patient moves within the vehicle um, during a frontal crash. And there's really two ways the body can respond to a frontal crash. These are going to be dependent on a number of things, including the speed of the vehicle, the size of the patient, the way the patient has their seat um, positioned, and the size of the vehicle or the object in which they're hitting. Patients can either go up and over the steering wheel or down and under, and you're going to get a completely different injury pattern depending on how the patient's propelled within the vehicle. So let's watch these two. Let's start with an up and over. In a front impact accident, the occupant can be propelled up and over the steering wheel to impact on the steering wheel and the windshield. I always loved the blood spatter they had to add there. Whew. All right, let's go down and under. 
In a front impact accident, the occupant can be propelled under the seat to impact in the dashboard. This produces circular marks in the dashboard and injury to the occupant's legs, hip, and spine. So if we actually look at injury patterns, if your patient was involved in an up and over, you're going to see that the upper part of the steering wheel tends to be bent if your EMS is bringing pictures in. You can see that picture there. You can see how the upper part of the steering wheel is bent. You can also see starring of the windshield, both of which would indicate that the patient was propelled up and over. Whereas in that second picture, you can see how the bottom of the steering wheel is bent, meaning that the patient likely bent down and under. You can also see in that far picture from me here, or the near picture on this side, the knee imprints. Uh, in the knee bolsters. So, you know, those would all be indicative of the patient going down and under as opposed to up and over. Now, why does this matter? Because injury patterns are different depending on whether your patient was an up and over or a down and under. In an up and over, head, neck, and facial injuries are more common as well as chest injuries, whereas a down and under are more likely to have abdominal and chest injuries and lower extremity injuries. So you might have a little bit of a different injury pattern depending on which way your patient went. The other thing I have to mention just really quickly, I won't get into this too deep because I'm almost out of time, but um, the speed in frontal crashes, it should be obvious, but the faster the car is going at the time of the frontal crash, the more the injury, uh, the, more patient, the more likely the patient is to be injured. Now, as we're gonna see in some of these charts coming up, you're gonna see ISS scores, and if you haven't worked as a trauma program manager, that may be a little bit of a, a foreign um, uh, term to you, but an ISS score is just a way that we uh, objectively measure the severity of injuries, and a nine plus, would be a moderate injury and a 15 plus would be a severe injury. So as you can see, if a vehicle is moving at 10 to 20 at a frontal crash, they have a 1.94% chance of a moderate injury and a 0.46 chance of a, a severe injury. But then look at how those percentages change as your speeds increase. So I, I, I won't uh, say anything more about that chart except to, to show it. The last thing I want to say, and then we're going to go into injury patterns itself, is to remember in a frontal crash, the body will move in the same direction as the vehicle, always. So when we think about the injuries, the body's always going to go uh, in the same direction that the vehicle is. We sometimes call it the Superman effect, but if you are able to get pictures of the crash scene, think about taking the car and pulling it to unbend it. Like, what direction would you have to pull the car in to fix the damage? And the direction you pull it in is the direction the patient moved. So again, when you have somebody hit at the 11 o'clock position, you would have to take the front of that car and kind of pull it towards 11 o'clock. That's the direction the patient faced when they hit. So when you're thinking about what they hit, think about what, how you would have to pull the frame out to fix it afterwards. And that's, now that's only for frontal crashes. That won't work for the other types of crashes. So what are the injury patterns of a frontal crash? Yes, ladies, that's for you. According to Trauma Registry, which of those five areas of the body do you think is most likely to be injured in a frontal crash? So I hear chest is number one. I hear head. I think I'm going to surprise you all. Number one is lower extremity. Lower extremity is number one in frontal crashes as percentages go. Number two is the pelvis and femur. Number three is the chest. And then number four and five are the head and abdomen. So that's, that's, the, that's, that, that's, that's the percentage of injuries we see in frontal crashes. But let's look a little bit more at injuries associated specifically with these areas of the body. Let's start with the lower extremity. So what types of injuries do we see in the lower extremity? One thing you mightn't think about, but ankle and tib fib fractures from the floor pan, from the gas pedals, from everything down there that our feet are on. This is especially common um, in, in our um, peers that are vertically challenged, is that the proper way to say that? Um, those of a shorter stature. Because if you're of a shorter stature, you're more likely to lock your knee, especially if you're trying to brake at the time of the incident. You know, I can say at my height, I can't lock my knee on the brake. Even when I'm slamming on the brake, I'm too tall, my knee will always be bent. So when the impact happens, my leg's gonna get thrown this way but somebody of shorter stature will lock the knee on the brake or the gas pedal, whichever one, and when the knee is locked and you get hit, then what happens? Your knee's not gonna bend, instead your ankle and your tib-fib are going to evert off the side of the pedal. So you end up with these tib-fib fractures, you end up with these ankle injuries because of eversion of the ankle off the side of the pedal. And then of course, well, I'll show you a video of this in a minute, but the mangled limb from the passenger compartment intrusion. Um, so when you actually have intrusion into the passenger compartment, you've got your brake, your emergency brake down there, you've got a lot of stuff down in that area that can mangle the limb directly. And I think the next video will show that. Oh, not yet. It'll come in a minute. <laughs> you get to go back to the guy. 
Uh, pelvis and femur injuries, so these really have to do with the knee meeting, the, meeting either the dashboard or the knee bolsters. Uh, so when, as the patient slides forward or if there's direct intrusion to the passenger compartment, it's going to tend to hit the knee, which can then cause you know, the, the transmission of energy up the leg. So patellar injuries, femur injuries, acetabular pelvic fractures, and hip dislocations. And that lower picture is just a great picture of a hip dislocation in a female. You can tell the mechanism of injury. You can see the abrasion on the knee where she slid forward in, in her knee hit the, the knee bolster. And then, of course, the transmission then caused that anterior dislocation uh, of, the, uh, of the hip. I think the video's next. When the structure collapses, yeah. injuries are more likely. In the case of the town and country, the dummy's left leg was gouged by the intruding parking brake pedal, and its knee was severely cut by a bracket underneath the instrument panel. The dummy skin's a lot tougher than human skin, so this doesn't bode well for real humans in this type of crash. So there you can see how the, the brake pedal, you know, directly mangled the leg. It'd be very different if we're a human being. Um, and just, just to, very quickly, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, uh, on this slide, but this is the actual um, parts of the car and, and, and the, you know, how they injure both the upper and the lower leg. So for the lower leg, it's going to be mainly the floor intruding in on the um, patient that's going to cause 68% of injuries. Foot controls, including the parking brake, 25%. And then for the, for the femur and the, the pelvis, it's mainly the instrument panel and the knee bolster. So sliding forward into those knee bolsters at the bottom of your dashboard. All right, now just quickly, with a pelvic fracture, when your patient comes in, motor vehicle collision, pelvic fracture, what associated injuries should you always consider when your patient's got a pelvic fracture from a frontal? Yeah, bladder, GU basically, GU and rectal, right? So it's gonna be mainly your GU and your rectal uh, tend to go with the mechanism of injury, the way that the acetabulum crushes, it gets into the GU and the, and the rectal area. Uh, for patients with posterior hip dislocations, uh, what, uh, um, what uh, associated injury should you always look for that often goes with your posterior hip dislocations that slide into the knee bolster? Okay, no? Sciatic nerve. Gotta go. Sciatic nerve is more likely to be injured if you have a posterior hip dislocation. Remember with posterior, the leg's in, inverted in, inwards like you see in the picture. And then if the knee is dislocated uh, from sliding into the dashboard, what injury is associated with that? Okay, no? No, oh, it's going to be your uh, popliteal artery it tends to be either disrupted or uh, decreased blood supply, needing emergent uh, treatment. All right, let's look at chest injuries associated with a frontal crash. So chest injuries, um, are probably pretty obvious, but sternal fractures, myocardial contusions, ruptures, aortic disruptions, pulmonary contusions, hemothorax, pneumothorax, and rib fractures. Believe it or not, rib fractures may in a small way be good because if the rib fractures, it dissipates the energy away from the lung and heart. Not to say that you can't get horrible injuries with rib fractures, but there is a little bit of uh, positive rib fractures tend to dissipate the in energy away. But there, of course, you can see the seatbelt mark as well as a steering wheel mark that would indicate significant underlying injury. Uh, patients with sternal fractures should always make you think of what associated injury? This one's too obvious. Blunt cardiac injury, right? A BCI, blunt cardiac injury. And patients with fractures of the first and second rib should always make you think of? Great vessel, mainly, great vessel injuries. So aortic or brachial plexus injuries with the first and second rib. And scapular fractures should always make you think of? These are gonna be especially associated with uh, high speed frontals. These are gonna be your, your, a lot of your pulmonary stuff because the scapula is so strong to actually fracture it often causes underlying pulmonary um, injury. And then finally, uh, head injuries. Um, I mean, let me tee the video up. What's amazing about this video is you're about to watch a frontal crash, of course, and there is airbags involved, but watch how the airbags really don't provide as much protection as you might think to the head and face. So let me tee it up now. Watch the head and face and how, how they're not as protected as you might think by an airbag. So head and neck and facial trauma, this is going to be caused uh, the, by the face going into the steering wheel directly if there's no airbag. Uh, into the dashboard, especially if you have a, uh, if you if you're an offset, if it's an offset, they're more likely to go into the dashboard than they are the airbag. Um, if they are in the front seat, front seats get more facial and head injuries than back seats. And then, especially uh, if your patient is an offset at 11 o'clock and they're the driver, or one o'clock and they're the passenger. Why? 
because at 11 o'clock, the face will go directly into the A pillar. Now, the A pillar is that little pillar in the front that holds your roof up. We, call the, we, na we name the pillars A is the front one, B is the middle one, C is the back one, and then SUVs have a D. So when, if you're the driver and you're hit at 11 o'clock, your face will miss the airbag and go right into the A pillar. If you're the passenger, it happens at 1 o'clock. So facial injuries tend to be a little bit higher when you get those offsets at that point of the clock. So some of the head and neck trauma includes coup contra coup injuries, intracranial bleeds, and then the spinal cord injuries can include C2 fractures um, as the head hits the windshield or central cord syndromes um, as, the, as their subluxation of the vertebrae off of each other during the mechanism. If people have fractures of the temporal or parietal bone as part of the trauma, you should always think of what associated injury. What goes with those fractures? Epidurals, right? Those are your epidurals. Um, and then what injury is often associated with maxillofacial trauma? Don't think too deep here. Spinal cord injury, right? Uh, facial injuries have a little bit of higher risk of cervical spinal trauma. Finally, the abdomen. Um, compression of the abdominal organs uh, can occur directly from hitting the airbag, from the seat belt cutting in. You can get burst injuries of the small intestine, colon, or mesentery, and then rupture the diaphragm as the seat belt cuts in and it pushes the abdominal organs up against the diaphragm. Looking at those two pictures, um, those are both, both have seat belt marks, so you can see the seat belt sign on both of them, but what summary can you draw when you look at those two different seat belt marks from a biomechanic standpoint? I'm gonna say that I'm much more worried about A than B, why? A is high, yeah, so A either wore the seatbelt too high or slid down under the seatbelt causing it to cut up into the abdomen, whereas B it's sitting across the pelvic bones. Now that doesn't mean B can't have significant injury, but B's seatbelt worked. It put the energy into the pelvic bone, the strongest part of the body, so the, the risk of intra-abdominal injury is lower on the second picture than the first picture. Uh, so fractures of ribs 8 through 12 on the right should always make you think of. Oh, come on, this one's not hard. Liver, absolutely. And fractures of 8 through 12 on the left make you think of spleen, absolutely. Um, so let me just, how much time do I have? One minute. Woo, okay. Injuries related to safety devices, you can see up there in yellow where the seat belt tends to sit and the organs that lie under the seat belt. The area in blue shows you where the airbag deploys and the injuries associated with airbags. What, what you have to think about with seat belts in the abdomen is where the patient's seated in the car. Look at the young man in blue, where if he slides forward at 50 miles per hour into that seat belt, what organs are we gonna get hit? Spleen, whereas the driver, it's liver. So your drivers tend to have a little bit of a higher rate of liver injury, your passenger spleen, because of where they cut the seat belt cuts in. Uh, the seatbelt sign is where you have the bruising on the outside of the abdomen um, after the motor vehicle collision. If your patient has an, you can actually see the bruising, the redness or the abrasions from the seatbelt, 30% of them will have significant internal injuries. And of those that have internal abdominal injuries, 50 to 60% will also have chance fractures or fractures of L1 to L3 because of the way they accordion down on themselves. And this is the last video I'll play. This is what happens when you don't wear your seatbelt. There you can see the bullets within the vehicle, how they hit their heads against each other, and the head injuries that result. And the little dramatic, uh, little drama as well. And there you can see without a seatbelt in the back seat. And it looks to me as though my time is up. I thought we would at least get past frontal crashes, but we didn't. So I guess if you want to see more crashes, you have to invite me back another year. But that gives you a little bit of a, oh geez, that gives you just a little bit of an overview of some biomechanics, at least on frontal crashes. Thank you very much for your time. Yeah.